is. Looks like today's problem just showed up. I need to tell Zundamon right away. Meden, did something happen? Zundamon, perfect timing. Oh, so this is today's problem. What in the world is this? It kind of looks like differentiation. You're right, it does. This looks very similar to the derivative symbol, but actually it's not the same. It's a Q derivative operator. And by the way, this one here is the usual derivative operator. There is a deep connection between the two. Let me explain that now. Please do! First, let's draw the graph of the function y equals f of x. Then, when the x-coordinate is x, the function takes the value f of x. Well, that makes sense. Now, let's multiply x by q. Here, we'll take q as a parameter between 0 and 1. Since q is less than 1, qx is closer to the origin than x. Okay, let's draw a line passing through these two points. Then, what would be the slope of this line? Um, the slope of the line is the ratio of the change in y to the change in x, right? If we look at the ratio of the changes between the two points, the change in the x direction is x minus qx, and the change in the y direction is f of x minus f of qx. Exactly. This fraction represents the slope of the line through the two points. In other words, the average rate of change between them. Rate of change. That sounds kind of like differentiation. That's right. In fact, this is the definition of the q derivative of f of x. Now, a q derivative is not a derivative in the usual sense. However, we can think of it as a kind of discrete analog of the usual derivative through the parameter q. In fact, if we let the parameter q approach 1, that means qx approaches x. Therefore, we obtain the slope of the tangent at x. In other words, the q derivative converges to the usual derivative. Um, what does that mean exactly? Let's organize our thoughts a bit. This was the definition of the q derivative. It represents the average rate of change between two points. And when q approaches 1, this becomes the usual derivative. Of course, that is assuming the function is differentiable in the usual sense. I see, that makes sense. In short, we can write it like this. When q approaches 1, the q derivative operator becomes the usual derivative operator. But, is it okay to write it like that? Please forgive a bit of notation abuse. By the way, since we assume q is less than 1, more precisely, q approaches 1 from smaller values. To express that, it's more accurate to write 1 minus. But we'll omit that detail here, so keep it in mind. I'm not sure I fully get it, but okay. The concept of q derivative might seem special at first glance. But from this perspective, we could even say that the usual derivative is just a special case when q approaches 1. Also, thinking of q as a number just a bit smaller than 1 might help you grasp the concept more easily. Well, that's just an intuition though. Alright, I'll keep that in mind. Now let's compare the usual derivative and the q derivative. First, in the usual derivative, the change in the x direction is expressed as x plus h minus x. Usually we just write it as h. And the change in the y direction is written as f of x plus h minus f of x. Here, we want to represent an infinitesimal change, but there's no actual infinitesimal number in the real numbers. So instead, we take the limit as h approaches 0 to represent that infinitesimal change. That was the definition of the usual derivative. Oh yeah, I remember that now. On the other hand, with the q derivative, instead of adding h to x, we multiply x by q. Yes. To put it a bit more technically, this reflects whether we describe change additively or multiplicatively. Of course, once we take the limit, both describe instantaneous change, but since q derivatives handle discrete change without taking a limit, the difference between additive and multiplicative becomes essential. I think I'm starting to get it. Now, how does this difference in definition affect the world of q derivatives? Let's find out. Got it. First, one interesting property of the q derivative is that the numerator and denominator can be defined separately. Uh, what do you mean by that? Let's represent the change in f as dqf. The change in f means the difference between f of x and f of qx. Then, what about the change in x itself, dqx? Wait a second. If f is just x itself, 
That means f of x equals x, and f of qx equals qx. Exactly. Now, we can redefine the q derivative. Here we'll treat dq and f of x as a single unit. Wait, this looks like it's the change in f divided by the change in x. Since we define them separately, it naturally turns into this fraction. Well done, Zundemann. This fraction matches the definition of the q derivative we saw earlier. So when it comes to the q derivative, the numerator and denominator can be defined separately, because they are treated as just differences. On the other hand, in the usual derivative, we've learned that the numerator and denominator don't make sense on their own. Well, saying they don't make sense might be a bit too strong. But, since we need careful treatment to handle infinitesimally small differences, it's certainly not as simple as this. Wow, I see! Thank you for waiting. Let's actually calculate a Q derivative. First, let me write down the definition of the Q derivative. Now, what happens when we take the Q derivative of x to the power of n? For simplicity, we assume n is a natural number. Leave it to me! Um... Let's proceed according to the definition of the Q derivative. Now, since we're considering f of x equals x to the n, we'll substitute f of x with x to the n. Then, fqx becomes qx to the n. So far, so good. Yes. Separate qx to the n into q to the n and x to the n. Now factor out the powers of x. Then the numerator becomes like this. And the denominator looks like this. This gives us an interesting result. Oh, really? This part is the Q analog of an integer. It's called a Q integer. We can also simplify this part. Then we can write the result like this. That looks nice. The form of this Q integer expression actually matches the formula for the sum of a geometric series. Since we'd assumed n is a natural number, this represents the sum of a geometric series with initial term 1 and common ratio Q up to the nth term. And as Q approaches 1, each of the n terms approaches 1. That means the Q integer of n approaches n. Oh, you're right. This was actually something we covered in the previous video. Now let's combine this with our earlier result. We found that the Q derivative of x to the n takes this form. When Q approaches 1, the Q derivative on the left becomes the usual derivative, and the q integer of n on the right becomes n itself. That's the famous power rule for differentiation. So even as q approaches 1, the equation still holds. It's really cool to see the connection between the q derivative and the usual derivatives. But... What's wrong? I feel like we're forgetting something important, but I can't remember what it was. Sandeman, look over there. What? Oh my... The Q analog of the derivative is the Q derivative. Then what is the Q analog of the integral? In other words, this is a question of what the Q integral is. How fascinating. And the answer is written right over there. What? Oh my. That is the Q integral. It is also known as the Jackson integral. The notation looks very similar to the usual integral. The only difference is that there's a Q here. But I don't really understand the definition. It seems to involve an infinite sum, right? What could this infinite sum actually mean? Let's take a closer look. By the way, this infinite sum doesn't always converge, but let's assume it does for now. Yes! Now let's look into the definition of the Q integral. First, let's move the 1 minus Q inside the summation, and combine it with Q to the K times X. Then it becomes like this. Hmm, yeah, that makes sense. When we expand this infinite sum, for k equals 0, q to the k becomes q to the 0 equals 1. And q to the k plus 1 becomes q. I see, I get it now. For the next term, when k increases by 1, the exponent of q also increases by 1. So x gets multiplied by q. Then x becomes qx. And qx becomes q squared x. This process continues infinitely. Alright, that makes sense so far. Okay, let's call this infinite sum capital F of X and try to understand what it represents visually. First, suppose the graph of Y equals F of T looks like this. 
For simplicity, we assume f of t is always positive. It's a bit tricky, but let's think of the horizontal axis as the t-axis, and suppose t takes the value x here. This is for the case when x is positive. Hmm, this is kinda complicated. Now then, Zundaman! Yes! Can I leave the rest to you? Whoa, that came out of nowhere! Um, what should I do? Right now, we're trying to understand capital F of X using the graph, and in the expression for capital F of X, QX and Q squared X appear. That's true. Then let's mark QX on the graph. We'll say QX is around here. If we multiply by Q again, Q squared X will be about here. And this pattern continues infinitely. Now then, capital F of X is expressed as an infinite sum. The first term is the product of f of x and x minus qx. x minus qx represents the width of this part of the graph. And f of x represents the height here. So the product of f of x and x minus qx represents the area of this rectangle. Now, the meaning of capital F of x is becoming clear. Yeah! Furthermore, this width is qx minus q squared x, and the height here is f of qx. So the second term also represents the area of another rectangle. By adding up the areas of these rectangles infinitely, we get the true form of the q integral, capital F of x. Wonderful, Zundaman. We can really see why the q integral behaves like an integral. And in fact, we can take this one step further. Huh? Really? The q integral from 0 to x is represented by capital F of x, that means the Q integral from 0 to Qx is represented by capital F of Qx. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Then, the area of the first rectangle can be found by subtracting capital F of Qx from capital F of X. Oh, I get it. And the width of the rectangle is X minus Qx, while its height is F of X. We're ready. Now let's calculate the Q derivative of capital F of X. According to the definition of the Q derivative, we can calculate it like this. Here, the numerator represents the area of the first rectangle, and the denominator represents its width. So, this fraction divides the area by its width. That gives us the height. Exactly, that's f of x. What a beautiful result! When we take the Q derivative of capital F of x, we get f of x. So, capital F of x truly deserves to be called the Q integral of f of x. I see, that's how it works. By the way, this isn't a rigorous explanation, but roughly speaking, as Q approaches 1, the rectangles become narrower, and the Q integral approaches the area under the curve. That is, the usual integral. Wow, that's amazing! Up to this point, we've relied on the graph, but to properly prove the relationship between the Q derivative and the Q integral, we need to work through the calculation like this. Essentially, this is just expressing the same idea as before, so I'll go through it briefly. First, by replacing x with qx in capital F of x, that is multiplying by q, we obtain capital F of qx. When we look at it this way, we can see that most of the terms are shared. Therefore, when we subtract, only this part remains. Then if we divide both sides by x minus qx, the left-hand side becomes the Q derivative of the Q integral capital F of X, and the right-hand side becomes the original function F of X. So, the Q derivative of the Q integral brings us back to the original function. Bah! There's one important thing I haven't mentioned yet. The exponential function with base E has the property that differentiating it doesn't change it. Right! So, what about in the case of the Q derivative? There actually exists a function that remains the same under Q differentiation. It's called the Q exponential function, EQ of X. Just as E to the power of 0 equals 1, we have EQ of 0 equals 1. You sound like you've known all of this from the beginning. A full explanation would take a while, so I'll just mention it briefly. The exponential function E to the X can be expressed as an infinite sum like this. And the Q exponential function EQ of X, ignoring convergence for now, is formally defined like this. Oh yeah! The factorial of N has been replaced by something else. Exactly. That's the Q factorial of N. The product of key integers multiplied together like a factorial. I'll skip the proof, 
but if you calculate according to the definition of the Q derivative, you can show that the Q exponential function doesn't change even after taking the Q derivative. There's a lot of new information here. It's a bit confusing, but at least I understand that the Q exponential function is complicated. Let's summarize conceptually what we've seen so far. The field that deals with Q derivatives and Q integrals, known as Q calculus, can be seen as a deformation of usual calculus through the parameter Q. In that world, a theory like calculus unfolds, but it's somehow different. And as Q approaches 1, the difference from usual calculus disappears. That process is truly fascinating, isn't it? What we've discussed today is just a small part of Q calculus, or more broadly, a small piece of the vast world of Q analogs. If you're interested, please look into it further. Thanks for watching! If you'd like to support this channel, consider becoming a member. In this video, we talk about the purpose of our membership. Check it out if you're interested. Well then, take care everyone! See you later!